right, that was the very first one. I gotta find my place. Sounds good. All right, let's go. Number two says the beginning. It was not like I was looking for trouble. I didn't have to. At my height, it just always found me. My name is Michael Vay, and the story I'm about to tell you is strange, very strange. It's my story. Not really my story, but Michael Vay's story. If you passed me walking home from school, you probably wouldn't even notice me. That's because I'm just a kid like you. I go to school like you, I get bullied like you. Unlike you, I live in Ohio, Idaho. Don't ask me what state Idaho is in. Flash news, Idaho is a state. The fact that most people don't know where Idaho is is exactly why my mother and I moved here. So people wouldn't find us. But that's part of my story. Besides living in Idaho, I'm different from you in other ways. For one, I have Tourette's Syndrome. You probably, do, probably know less about Tourette's Syndrome than you do Idaho. Usually when you see someone on TV pretending to have Tourette's Syndrome, they are shouting, swear words, or barking like a dog. Most of us with Tourette's don't do that. I mostly just blink my eyes a lot. If I'm really anxious, I'll also clear my throat <clears> or <throat> make a gulping noise. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes kids make fun of me. It's no picnic having Tourette's, but there are worse things that can happen to you. Like having your dad die of a heart attack when you're eight. Believe me, that's much worse. I'm still not over that. Maybe I never will be. There's something else you don't know about me. It's my secret. Something that scares people more than you would believe. That secret is the reason we moved to Idaho in the first place. But again, that's part of my story. So I might as well tell it to you. Number three, the armpit. Mr. Dahlstrom, Mr. Dahlstrom's office is as good a place to begin as any, or as bad as of a place. Mr. Dahlstrom is the principal of Meridian High School, where I go to school. If you ask me, ninth grade is the armpit of life. And there I was in the very stinkiest part of that armpit, the principal's office. I was sitting in Mr. Dahlstrom's office, blinking like crazy. You could guess that I'm not, f I'm not fond of Mr. Dahlstrom, which would be stating the obvious, like saying breathing is important, or Rice Krispie Squares are the greatest food ever invented. No one at Meridian was fond of Mr. Dahlstrom, except Miss Duncan who directed the Glee Club. The Glee Club is um, a, like a singing choir class. She had a picture of Mr. Dahlstrom on her desk, which she sometimes stared at with soft googly eyes. Every time Mr. Dahlstrom came over the PA system, she would furiously whack her baton on the music stand to quiet us. Then after he'd said his piece, she would get all red-faced and sweaty and remind us of how lucky we were able to be led through the treacherous wild wilderness of high school by such a manly and steadfast defender of public education. Mr. Dostrom is a bald, thin, scarecrow of a man with a poochy stomach. Think of a pregnant Abraham Lincoln with no beard and a yellow toupee instead of a top hat, and you get the picture. He also looks like he's a hundred years old at least. When I was in fifth grade, our teacher told us that the easiest way to remember the difference between an you know, principal, principal, a chief administrator of a school, wait, 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 the easiest way to remember the difference between principal 
and underlying law of, or ethic and principal, the chief administrator of a school, of that principal is your pal. Believe me, Mr. Dalston did not put the pal in principal. He's not a pal. Okay. It was the second time that month I'd been called to his office for something someone else did to me. Mr. Dostrom was big on punishing the victim. I believe this is the second time you've been in my office this month, Mr. Dostrom said to me, his eyes half closed. Is that right, McVeigh? That was the other thing about Mr. Dostrom. He liked to ask questions that he already knew the answer to. I was never sure if I was supposed to answer him or not. I mean, he knew the answer. I knew the answer. So what's the point? Bottom line, it was the second time I'd been locked in my locker by Jack Varens. Varen. Varenus. And his friends that month. This time, they put me upside down and I nearly passed out before the custodian unlocked my locker and dragged me down to Mr. Dahlstrom's office. Jack Venaris was like 17 and still in ninth grade. He had been held back so many times. He had a driver's license, a car, a mustache, and a tattoo. Oh my gosh, I just lost my spot. <laughs> Okay. He sometimes called himself Jackal, which is a pretty accurate description since both he and the animal prey on smaller mammals. Jack had biceps the size of ripe Florida oranges and wasn't afraid to use them. Actually, he loved using them. He and his gang, Mitchell and Wade, watching Ultimate Fighting, and Jack took Brazilian jiu-jitsu lessons at, at a gym not far from our school. His dream in life was to fight in the octagon where he would pound people and get paid for it. Is that right? Mr. Dawson repeated, still staring at me. I, I ticked. That's what um, kids with Tourette's do. They tick like they like move, you know like jerk sometimes and they can't help it. Uh, Dawson repeated, still staring at me, I ticked almost a dozen times and then said, but sir, it, it wasn't my fault. They shoved me inside my locker upside down. He wasn't looking very moved by my plight, so I continued. There were three of them and they're a lot bigger than me, a lot bigger. My hope for sympathy was met by Mr. Dawson's infamous stare of death. Really? Really? You had to see, see it to understand. Last quarter, when we were studying Greek mythology, and when we got to the part about Medusa, the Gorgon woman who could turn people to stone by looking into their eyes, I figured out where Mr. Dawson had come from. Maybe it was Maybe it had something to do with my Tourette's, but I blurted out, That must be Mr. Dawson's great-great-great-great-grandmother! I guess because he stares. Okay. Everyone had laughed. Everyone except Mr. Dahlstrom, who had picked that precise moment to slip into our class. I spent a week in after-school detention, which wasn't all that bad because at least I was safe from Jack and his posse, who who somehow never got sent to the detention, no matter how many kids they stuffed into the lunchroom garbage cans or locked in lockers. Anyway, that had officially put me on Mr. Dawson's troublemaker list. Mr. Vay, can, you cannot be stuffed into your locker without your consent, Mr. Dawson said, which may be the dumbest thing ever said in school. You should have resisted. That's like blaming someone who got who was struck by lightning for getting in the way. But I tried, sir. Obviously not hard enough. He took out a pen. 
Who are these boys who allegedly stuff you into the locker? Mr. Dawson cocked his head to one side, his pen wagging impatiently in front of him. I stared at the pen, and it was hypnotic trajectory. I'm waiting, Mr. Vay. Their names? There was no way I was going to tell him. First, he already knew he had done it. Everyone knew Jack had put more kids in textbooks into lock he had put more kids than textbooks into lockers. Second, rattling out of Jack was the shortest route to death. I just looked at Mr. Dahlstrom, my eyes blinking like crazy. Stop twitching and answer my question. I can't tell you, I finally said. Can't or won't? Pick one, I thought. I forgot who did it, Mr. Dawson continued, staring at me through those half-closed eyes of his. Did you now? He stopped wagging his pen and set it on the desk. I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Vay. Now you'll have to take their punishment as well. Four weeks in after-school detentions. I believe you know where the detention is held. Yes, sir. It's in the lunchroom. Good. Then you'll have no trouble finding where you're finding your way there. Like I said, Mr. Dahlstrom excelled in punishing the victim. He signed a tardy excuse note and handed it to me. Give that to your teacher and you can go back to class now, Mr. Vicvay. Thank you, sir, I said, not entirely certain that I was thanking what I was thanking him for. I walked out of his office and slowly down the long, empty corridor to biology. The hallway was lined with posters made from the Basketball Boosters Club with messages like, Go Warriors! Sink the Vikings! That sort of thing. Rendered in bright poster paints, I got my backpack from my locker and then went to class. My biology teacher, Mr. Polson, <clears throat> a short, balding man with thick eyebrows and a massive comb-over. A comb-over is like when they don't have much hair and they kind of take all their hair from one side and they try to cover their bald spots. <laughs> do, 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 do. Was it, he was in the middle of lecturing and stopped mid-sentence at the entrance. Glad you decided to join us, Mr. McVeigh. Mr. Bay, sorry, not McVeigh. Sorry, I was at the principal's office. Mr. Dawson said to give this to you. I handed him my note. He took the paper without looking at it. Sit down, we're reviewing for tomorrow's test. Every eye in class followed me as I walked to my desk. I sat in the second row from the back, just behind my friend, Austin Liss, who was one of the smartest kids in the universe. Austin's name looks European or something, but it isn't. His mother named him that because he was born in Austin, Texas. It was his private curse that she had spelled it wrong. I'm going to show you. Right there, it says Alston. She spelled it with an O instead of an A. Isn't that funny? I suspect that old Austin was adopted because I couldn't figure out how someone that smart could, could come from someone who couldn't spell the name of the city she lived in. But even Austin's mom wasn't the brightest crayon in the box. I liked her a lot. She spoke with a Texan accent and called everyone honey which was, which may sound annoying, but it wasn't. She was always nice and kept a supply of red licorice in the pantry just because she knew I liked it and my mother didn't buy candy. Austin never got shoved into his locker, probably because he was wider than it. Not that Jack and his friends left him alone. They didn't. In fact, he had stuffed the ultimate, suffered the ultimate humiliation from Jack and his friends. He had been pantsed in public. How'd it go with Dahlstrom? Austin whispered. I shook my head. Brutal. 
As I sat down, Taylor Ridley, who sat in the desk to my left, turned and smiled at me. Taylor was a cheerleader and one of the prettiest girls in Meridian. Heck, she's the only pr she's one of the prettiest girls in any high school anywhere in the world. She was she has a face that could be on the cover of a beauty magazine. Long, light brown hair with big brown eyes and the color of maple syrup. Since I'm being completely honest here, I admit that I had a crush on her from the second the second I first saw her. It took me less than a day to realize that so did everyone else at Meridian. Taylor was always nice to me. At first I hoped she was nice because she liked me, but really she was just one of those people who is nice to everyone. Nice or not, it didn't matter. She was way out of my league. Like a thousand miles out of my league. So I never told anyone about my secret crush. Not even Austin. <laughs> who I told everything. Some dreams are just too embarrassing to share. Anyway, whenever Taylor looked at me, it made my tics go wild. Stress does that to people with Tourette's. I forced myself not to blink as I sat down and pulled my biology book out of my backpack. That's the thing about tics. If I try real hard, I can delay them, but I can't make them go away. It's like having a bad itch. You can ignore it for a little while, but it's going to build up until you scratch. I've learned tricks to hide my tics. Like sometimes, I'll drop my pencil on the ground. Then I'll bend down to get it. I'll blink or grimace like crazy. I'm sure the kids around me think I'm really clumsy because sometimes I'll drop my pencil four or five times in one class. Anyway, between Mr. Dahlstrom and Jack and Taylor, I was blinking like an old neon sign. Polson started up again. Okay, class, we're going to take, we're talking about electricity in the body. I sing the body electric, said the poet Whitman. Who, pray tell, can explain what role electricity plays in the body? He panned the room with his dusty gaze, clearly disappointed with the lack of participation. Who better know this pe you better know this people it's on your test tomorrow electricity runs our heart the girl with massive braces in the front row said correct he said and what else taylor raised her hand it signals all our nerves and thoughts that's right miss ridley and where does this electricity come from he looked around the room where does the electricity come from? Come on, people! It was dangerous when no one was answering because that's when he started hunting out those least likely to answer correctly. How about you, Mr. Morris? Uh, batteries? The class laughed. Brilliant, Polson said, shaking his head. Batteries. Okay, Mr. Morris, perhaps it's time you changed your batteries because you're clearly running them down. Where does electricity come from, Mr. Vey? I swallowed. Uh, electrolytes? I said. That would be true, Mr. Vey. If you were an electric eel. Everyone laughed again. Taylor glanced over at me sympathetically. I dropped my pencil on the floor. Austin raised his hand. Mr. Liss! Polson said, enlighten us. Austin straightened himself up, his chair like he was about to get, deliver a lecture, which he was. The human body generates an electrical current through chemical concentrations of the nerves in a process called bioelectrogenesis. Whenever a nerve signal is sent, potassium ions flood out over the nerve cells and sodium ions flood in. Both of these ions have slightly different charges, and so the difference in ionic concentrations inside and outside the nerve cell creates a charge, which our bodies process as electricity. Bravo, Mr. Liss! Harvard, await Harvard awaits. For those of you who have no idea what Mr. Liss just said, I'll write it on the board. 
bioelectrogenesis. When Paulson's back was turned, Austin turned around and whispered, What happened with Goldstrom? Did Jack get detention? I shook my head. No, I caught detention. His eyebrows rose. For getting shoved into your own locker? Yeah, Dahlstrom's a tool. That I know.